For nearly a century, life on the Baker River has been held in a delicate balance. On one side of the scale, the Baker River is home to steelhead and five species of salmon. President Theodore Roosevelt described it as one of the most important sockeye habitats in the lower 48. Tipping the scale on the other side are the river's two hydroelectric dams built by Puget Sound Energy that provide power to the northwest. At times, the scale has tipped so far as to bring the sockeye to the edge of extinction. But over the decades, innovations in fish propagation and fish passageways have vastly improved the ability to sustain fish populations. Baker became square one for research. From propagation to upstream passage to downstream passage, each generation has thought they had the answer. I think that's why fish passage on the Baker River is so interesting because there were so many pioneering, path-breaking moments. Pacific salmon begin their lives as eggs hatched in freshwater creeks. Upon maturing, they head downstream to the ocean, where they may spend anywhere from six months to seven years. As adults, they return to the freshwater stream of their origin to lay their eggs and begin the life cycle anew. Any impediment to this journey would have a long-lasting impact on the salmon life cycle. In 1917, PSE's predecessor, Puget Sound Power and Light, announced the construction of a hydroelectric dam on the Baker River. It's one of the first high dams proposed in Washington, and there's not a lot of good precedent or information about effective means of raising salmon above 30 or 40 feet. It's a very pivotal moment. The Department of Fisheries are beginning to take a stand. The department is going to contest the building of the Baker Dam unless something can be worked out. University of Washington professor John Cobb was tasked with finding a viable means to elevate fish up and over the high dam and undertook a research experiment on the White Salmon River. He sets up this experiment that is flawed because of bad water conditions, but he decides that he has enough to say it's gonna work. And from this three-day test in April 1924, Puget Sound Power and Light gets their license for the Baker River Dam, and they're going to use Cobb's work. With the completion of the 245-foot dam in 1925, a fish ladder was constructed alongside the powerhouse. A series of six-by-ten-foot pools, each rising two feet above the previous one, allowed the salmon to leap from one pool to the next in easy stages. After ascending 42 feet in this manner, the salmon entered a submerged tank car that was pulled up a steep incline and unloaded into the reservoir behind the dam. For the downstream migration, the fingerlings were simply allowed to pass through the dam's spillways, falling 260 feet into the river below. And that's the way downstream fish passage was taken care of from 1925 all the way up until the late 50s. Not a lot looked into about the survival rates of that. The Lower Baker Dam in and of itself became an experiment in fish passage. A year after the fish passage system was completed, the Department of Fisheries reported that 3,492 sockeye returned to the Baker River trap. The Journal of Electricity praised the results, stating, no longer will the power companies be restrained from building as high a dam as needed across any of our salmon streams. But the promise of success was short-lived. Water flowing down the fish ladder was insufficient at times to attract the fish upstream. We didn't know much about fish passage at the time, and so the designs were inadequate, and we were killing a lot of the fish. In 1929, an entirely new upstream passage system was built, starting with a new fish trap at the base of the dam. They trapped the salmon right at the front of the barrier, loaded it into a little rail car. The rail car went up and dumped the fish into the aerial tram, and the aerial tram took it up the dam. Once over the dam, they were piped into a floating cage that was towed by boat over a mile up the lake and then released. Despite this one-of-a-kind system and its first year of operation, the returning salmon numbers were devastating. 
There is this question in 1933 when they're looking at only have trapped 600 sockeye that perhaps they're looking at the extinction of the run on this river. Slowly, the numbers began to climb, moving to a high of 6,894 in 1942. With a constant eye on the salmon, research conducted on the salmon heading downstream determined that only 36% of the young sockeye salmon survived the 260-foot drop through the dam's spillway. The utility company, now known as Puget Power, began working on a solution, starting first with a ski jump style shoot, which helped the fish clear the face of the dam. Survival shot way up. Now, now it worked as a fish passage system, but the weakness of it was we had to keep the pool up and we lost total pool control. Engineers and biologists went back to the drawing board, developing a floating surface collector, which became known as the gulper. The idea of the gulper was to create an artificial stream to attract fish up to the surface collect them in this floating barge, and then bypass them around the dam through a pipeline. The gulper idea had never been tried before, right? It was wholly new. So they constructed a prototype, installed it at Lower Baker in 1958, and said, whoa, this thing really does work. It was a site of really important work on fish passage and propagation, partly because the utility knew they wanted to build a second dam on the river. The new dam, proposed earlier in the decade, quickly fueled opposition from fish advocates. There was a protest by the state and federal fish agencies because they recognized that the Baker sockeye spawned primarily on beaches in Baker Lake. The proposed dam would elevate the lake by 60 feet, erasing the natural spawning beaches along the shoreline. When you cover up a river bottom with a reservoir, that has impacts because it's a loss of habitat. There was a lot of effort thrown at developing mitigation measures. And so one of the ways they got the government agencies to agree with their license application was by funding all these research studies. A group of state and Puget Power employees set out to conduct extensive research on sockeye reproduction. Biologists sought to mimic the natural conditions that sockeye experienced on the lake shores of Baker Lake. They develop artificial spawning beds, which is the first of its kind. When you read the accounts of people that were working up at Baker on the spawning beaches, there was this sense that they were all in it together. They all believed in hydropower, but they all also wanted the fish to survive. The first artificial spawning beach was completed in 1957. Nothing like that had been tried. It resulted in two additional spawning beaches, and over the years to follow, it was a very successful program. With the addition of a second dam on the Baker River, adult salmon returning upstream would now have to bypass two dams to spawn. In 1958, a new barrier dam was installed half a mile downstream from the lower dam powerhouse, to guide the returning salmon into a steel bin on the riverbank. From there, the fish were loaded into an aerated tank truck. They're then driven 15 miles and released into the upper reservoir, Baker Lake, where they're free to, to migrate to their natal stream. Some fish, however, are taken all the way to the original spawning beaches. For juvenile fish headed back downstream, Puget Power drew on research from their gulper prototype, previously installed on the lower dam, and installed a new and improved version behind the upper dam in 1960. The design became the standard for enhancement programs on rivers throughout the West. There was tremendous optimism that all problems had been solved. And what did we do? We walked away. We took our eye off the ball. Any sense of optimism was dashed when the returning sockeye count hit a low of just 99 in 1985. The run crashed. The realization really sunk in, we're gonna extirpate this run if we don't get on the ball. And it was like, whoa, wake up call. We did not know at the time whether or not we could save them. Puget Power formed the Baker River Committee, aligning forces with federal and state agencies. Also at the table were the Upper Skagit, Sauk Seattle, and Swinomish tribes, whose right to act as co-managers of the salmon was established in the landmark Bolt decision in 1974. The bold decision gave you legitimacy at the table to say, look, 
your management practices are going to harm our share. The two objectives were to arrest the decline of Baker River sockeye, and then secondly, if at all possible, to reverse it. There are many reasons why salmon populations have, have declined. And whatever we can do, it's sort of like a pan scale, you know, it's, it's like this, and we have to keep piling things to even that back up. That's been our goal, is to make sure that we look at the big picture and see what we could do to make, make sure that the fish have a place to return to. Over the next several years, a new spawning beach was added to prevent crowding, and all were divided into separate sections to limit the spread of viruses. Fry were allowed to mature to the smolt stage before being released, improving their survival rates from 0.2% to 90%. Wider and deeper nets with smaller mesh were added to the floating surface collectors. From there, instead of piping the fish downstream, the trap and truck method used to bring fish upstream was now being used to move the salmon past the dams below. All these pieces were experimental, but it was an experiment that was successful and it continued. In 1994, nine years after returning sockeye numbered just 99 salmon, their numbers hit a record high of nearly 16,000. 1994 was the first really strong indication that we just might be able to pull it off. Between 2004 and 2012, as part of a new relicensing agreement, Puget Sound Energy spent 50 million replacing the trap and truck facility, building a new hatchery capable of producing six and a half times the number of fry produced previously and installing two new state-of-the-art floating surface collectors. The Baker floating surface collector is no small achievement. It sets a new benchmark on the international stage. The new floating surface collectors dramatically improved the numbers of juvenile salmon heading to the ocean. In 1985, when we first started taking a hard look at the gulpers, we saw 8,800 fish leaving the reservoirs. Compare that with 2014, with the two floating surface collectors in operation, we passed over a million fish. In 2012, returning sockeye reached an all-time high of over 48,000. That's indicative of a trend going the right direction. If those smolt to adult survival rates persist, we can expect some even larger runs into the future. After nearly nine decades, the Baker River has taught us that restoring nature is both a daunting and humbling task. But with every seasonal run of salmon, more and more is learned, experience accumulates, and the evolution of ideas continues to improve results. What we've learned over time is that we've got a lot to learn. We'll always have a lot to learn, but it's something that we've all got to commit to. And we're going to be vigilant and learn by any mistakes that we've made and continue the, the growth in that run because it is paramount to these people. The hard work that many individuals have put into this is paying off. Sockeye salmon has persisted through some adverse setbacks and now are probably as numerous, if not more so than ever. I would give Puget credit for supporting the effort that allowed that creation and development to occur. And I think it is a commitment to the idea that you can have both. You can have power and fish. Amid the undeniable need for energy in this modern age, opposing voices have found a common note in their effort to find a delicate balance to sustain all life that flows from the Baker River.